last. It was not very popular with our colleagues, but what it did, and the reason it was so important, especially in the Iraqi context, was we had no idea who had kidnapped her. Uh, we didn't want to raise the profile too high right away. And of course, this is exactly what the kidnappers were expecting. They said, hang on, we have an American here. We're expecting a huge you know, fireworks display in the news the next day, and that never came. So we were hoping to give as much um, room for self-doubt in their own minds, so perhaps maybe they might, and, and we didn't know who held her, so maybe they might decide that maybe this is just a bad idea and give, before raising the stakes, giving an opportunity for them to literally just drop her off at a roundabout somewhere in Baghdad or have second thoughts or, or, um, or find out, you know, just, just come up with a different solution that didn't require um, some kind of negotiation or being in touch with us or, or anything else. The other thing too, protective move for the correspondent uh, themselves because well, not only are you not raising the price of the, of the journalist by making it clear that this is such an important person that we need to act on it immediately, um, you also don't know what stories they are telling their captors. You don't know whether they're saying that they are not American, for example, for all we knew. I mean, they, Jill could have said that she was Irish. Or, so we didn't want to prejudice what stories she may be saying, and so we tried to manage the best that we could the amount of information that was coming out about her. Um, early on. But beyond these early guesses about a prudent path to take, essentially the Christian Science Monitor was making their own kidnap plan on the fly. Would that be fair? Well, that is fair. And in fact, I mean, I don't know that you can really go beyond that. doing because that because, every, well, every, every single kidnapping, I mean, what we found in looking at all the Iraq cases, especially, was that every single kidnap case is different. So the crucial you need to have laid out. You need to have, as an organization, have decided, right, this is the person who's probably the best experience to handle a situation like this or to be our frontline person with an executive authority on the ground in Baghdad. For example, this is who's going to handle it uh, for us. Our headquarters is in Boston. Um, you know, this is the person who's going to liaise with the FBI and with the gov U.S. government institutions who, who agencies who just impose themselves on the situation sometimes providing something of value and sometimes not, and which is a whole nother, whole nother story. But in the end, every situation is different because it depends on who they're kidnapped by, what you know about it, and also what response, what reaction the, act, the kidnappers give. I mean, it was two and a half weeks before we had the first video about Jill that we even knew that she was alive. So how do you reach out to Nothing. I mean, you have no idea. And that's why it, it, you need to have the basics down, but then you need to really be flexible enough to make your plan or that the tools of your plan are going to be effective, as effective as they can be in I'm, your situation. I'm going to throw this open to the delegates here now, because I suspect uh, more, of the, more of the people here have more in common with the Christian Science Monitor's budgets and scope than they do with the enormous and impressive resources well, the BBC well, has at its except disposal. Except that, you know, I, I absolutely agree with Scott. You know, every, every situation would be different and you must, of course, stay flexible and you have to judge it on, on the circumstances in which you find yourself. So a plan might be no use to you. But <laughs> of the organisations represented here, how many have a plan? CNN. Um, I don't know who you represent. Did, does anyone want to talk about why they set one up? That they wished they had a, done it earlier? That they had anyone want to? I'm quite happy to take contributions. Yeah. Okay. Um, got someone kidnapped um, uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, we, we had a plan back then. And, and Fran makes a good point. I mean, no matter how detailed your plan is, it has to be sort of, you know, infinitely variable according to what actually happens. But you can put in place a plan of, you know, who are we going to alert? How are we going to get our security company involved in it? Who are we going to reach out to in a certain territory we have as good local contacts within governments or in law enforcement agencies, if that might be applicable? Um, at what stage we sort of you know, reach out to the families of the people concerned? How are we going to get people in to support them? There's a lot that you can put in place that are sort of standard ground rules and you can take your way through. And then obviously, you know, the circumstances there, do we want to ring around the other broadcasters and ask for a news blackout? Do we want the other news broadcasters to go live with this? Who are our contacts and the other news organisations do we need to speak to? How we do it if it was three in the morning, that kind of thing. Rodney would you expect every news organization to have worked out some of those common details already? And is it your experience that they have? I'm afraid not. Uh, and I wouldn't expect it because it's been our experience that the, the whole safety issue 
isn't yet taken as seriously and as professionally across the industry as it should be. The number of companies that do take proper safety precautions and put proper safety practices into effect uh, are relatively small around the world, I'm afraid. But if you look at the scale of the problem, we, we all stood earlier for the number of journalists killed. The number of journalists uh, and news media staff kidnapped this year, the ones who've died, exceed the numbers of the total kidnap just two years ago. So the, the problem is growing, and my sense is, and, and we've seen it in the audience, we're not prepared for this. You know, there are commercial companies around the world who take professional advice on kidnap and hostage taking. M they pay the international market for insurance premiums for hostage taking amounts to one billion dollars a year paid by global companies. How many of them are news organizations? Would you pay ransom if it got, most companies, you know, actually do pay ransom when it happens. Would we? Do we know if we would? Do we have a clue what is going on? Alan's description and Alan's demeanor I met him for the first time yesterday, has been truly extraordinary. His bravery, the way he handles it, the humor that he handles it with have been truly impressive. But let's not be deceived. This was a horrible experience. And when kidnapping happens, it's horrible to the person, to his family, to the news executive at the office, to friends and colleagues, to local staff, to the whole team. It is a ghastly, horrible, undertaking, and how well are we prepared for it? I guess we're not, really. You raised the issue of deals, deals mm. made, ransoms, and of course, there are other forms of deals. That's something that we absolutely wanted to tackle in this session. And I will, if I may, uh, play you, don't start just yet, play you a, a tape, a story that happened recently. I'm just gonna talk through it as it plays down. It involved a journalist from La Repubblica, um, Daniele Mastro Giacomo, uh, and uh, if we can play that tape now, I'll explain why we're, we're using this as a point. Uh, Daniele Mastro Giacomo was kidnapped along with his Afghan driver and Afghan translator by Taliban militants in southern Afghanistan on March the 5th this year. His driver, Syed Agha, was beheaded in front of his two colleagues. Now, one of Italy's better-known journalists and a frontline reporting... Mastro Giacomo's abduction attracted considerable media coverage and the usual allegations of hidden agendas refuted here by his news editor. absolute nonsense. Daniele is there to work, as everybody knows. He's just there to do his job. His job took him there, and it will take him there again. Thank you. But in a controversial deal, the Italian government persuaded President Hamid Karzai to release five jailed Taliban militants to free the reporter. This brought criticism from America, Britain, Germany, and the Dutch, who said it would make kidnappings in Afghanistan more likely. And there was more anger when the deal failed to secure the freedom of the translator Ajmal Nakashbandi. He was killed a few weeks later when the Afghan government refused to release any more militants. The Italian government defended itself, saying they were only trying to save lives. But the foreign minister went on to call for international guidelines to be set up on how to handle kidnappings. Well, this attracted a great deal of attention in Afghanistan, obviously, as the news of what had happened to the two local reporters uh, broke. And I, I would like to go, if we may, to, to our uh, Kabul satellite, to Ali Magan in Afghanistan. Ali, can, can you tell me how Afghan journalists, Afghan citizens, responded to what suddenly started looking like a, a, a bad case of double standards in the Western media here? As you mentioned, that this issue got a lot of international criticism from like America, other Western countries. It was also got a lot of criticism from the local media as well, because the first thing that the Afghan journalists just mentioned that the, the life of an Afghan is not that important like a foreigner. And second thing, while the government have uh, become pressurized from the Italian government and they have come to this point to make this deal uh, with the Taliban, given like five high-value Taliban terrorists, among them was brother of the Taliban uh, military commander Mullah Dadala, who is currently uh, heading the Taliban fight against the NATO in the, in the south of the country. So the Afghan uh, journalists and Afghan community and all people were very kind of criticized that issue, that while they were swapping uh, that five uh, high-value Taliban, why that Ajmal Nashbandi was not part of the deal?
So it was pretty much criticized by the Afghan uh, co journalist community and by the Afghan local populations in Kabul. That's why he was not part of the deal. We, and later on, a few days back, and uh, they demanded some two more uh, journalists uh, from the Afghan government, which Afghan government said no to that. So after that, they just give a deadline to that, and they just beheaded Ajmal Naqshbandi very brutally in the south. So the fear expressed then that it would make it much more dangerous for journalists in all countries to do their work in Afghanistan. Do, do you think that has been borne out? I mean, we've seen since that happened the kidnapping of the Korean aid workers. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that was the way. And I mean, after that, I mean, openly, the Mansur Dadullah, Taliban's military commander, have uh, been spoken to some of the media outlets, and they've just said that, I mean, as a result of this trade, uh, this kind of, kind of kidnapping, I mean, uh, it was successful kind of missions, and I will just incur I will just, I've been told all my loyalties, all my fighters, that whenever you have come across uh, to any person, any foreigners, actually, it's not only journalists, any foreigners, uh, working for any country or any of their local stuff, I mean, you can go for us. In, in the way, that was kind of encouraged Taliban, and they got what they wanted. So it was a kind of a successful mission for them. Scott Peterson, I, I know you've taken a particular view in Istanbul of, of how important it is to make your own local staff in your Iraq bureau feel like they are an equally valued member of the team. Can you talk to us a bit about that? Well, I think it is important to, <clears throat> to make sure that the local staff that, that uh, you're working with on a daily basis and that often that you rely upon to protect your life and also as much as you do to guide you, know, to guide you through, through their societies, they need to feel that they are a part of your team to the point where you know, they can rely upon you to do everything in your power to help preserve their lives and help to protect them as well. I mean, we had an incident uh, in March in which one of our security guards was kidnapped. Um, I was in Tehran at the time, and in fact, we had uh, a new correspondent who had only just arrived, and that was his first time in Baghdad working for us. Um, and so I, I went, came very quickly from Tehran and flew to Baghdad um, to be there. It wasn't that I was able to do anything concretely, in the sense that this, drive, that this security guard had been taken in what appeared to be an opportunity grab. It, he wasn't kidnapped while he was on the job. Um, but he was actually driving to work. Um, there had been a checkpoint set up on the road that diverted people uh, off into, um, off into uh, he lives in Dora, which is a terrible uh, district in Baghdad, which diverted people off the main drag and, and uh, down, to, um, down some very small back alleys. And all the traffic was going that way. And he got stopped at an, an insurgent checkpoint, it seems, and um, was kidnapped. And of course, it wouldn't have taken long before they found out probably that he was working for us. But in the end, we never saw him again. His brothers were doing the search. There was nothing that I physically, as a foreigner, could do. There was nothing that really that we could do um, in terms of, of alerting the troops, if you will, although it just so happened that our, our uh, correspondent who was there had just been embedded with American forces um, in that area. And so he was able to, he had telephone able to make calls and, and get a sense, at least to make sure that the Americans had not picked him up and, and also check that the Iraqi uh, forces uh, hadn't picked him up in those areas. So, but anyway, the point of, of that was that by going back, you were showing a degree of solidarity with your team. I mean, when I walked in the door to see the relief on their faces, not that the situation had changed one bit, but the fact that they were aware that, that somebody from the newspaper from their, you know, that, that, uh, that they were employed by was there on their behalf, was going to go to bat for them the best that they could, you know, was making the calls and using as much influence, uh, little as it may be, uh, to do everything that you can. And that was very, very important for our, for our team to see that. And in the end, it was, it was not successful, um, but, um, but we were waiting together and taking the steps together and, and also making, making decisions about, you know, who is going to have to go to the, the morgues and the hospitals and researches who's going to be in contact with the families and and having someone there who's able to make decisions was was really critical and for them it, it meant an awful lot thank you scott i should perhaps mention at this point that we are not kicking la republica here although we did ask them if they'd like to come and talk about their own experience of this uh, to a degree the newspaper seems to have been caught up in italian domestic politics as much as anything else but um, we did invite them to come we we hope there would be and there are other members i think of the italian media here and if any of them want to say anything about this um, they're most welcome to if i can go back to afghanistan quickly and just ask alim aga alim uh, 
the sort of the sort of care and attention that Scott Peterson is describing, how usual would you say is it for Western news organisations to to really make you feel like you have equal standing alongside the Western journalists that you so often put yourselves at such great risk to help? In this case, actually, I'm sorry to say, in the case of the Italian journalist, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Afghan, uh, his uh, Afghan friend was not uh, treated as the same as the Italian journalist was. And as a few days back, we were talking among other, other colleagues, they say that for, in case if we come to such kind of situation, so he, we just request from the whole, uh, like I, I will j just take the opportunity to say this, my message to all of the, because most of the audience are from the news-related agencies, that whenever if we come, but in such kind of situations, so please do not call your local staffs as a, a fixers or only translators. That gives kind of a reason to the person who, to your captor, that I mean, that this person is not as important as like the foreigner is. So in some cases, I will just say that I mean, if whenever we come to such kind of incident, to please also do call your uh, local staffs as a local journalist or local producer at least. So it will give them a little bit value to the person who is the captor that I mean they are also important their lives is also, also important they also have families and that so in they've been and uh, they're not treating kind of equally but uh, but in um, some other cases they are treating equally so this only request that we have I mean as few, um, we were talking with from the local media and local journals that they were saying that we should I mean all the local staff should be treated as the same like they also have families they also have relatives they also have like, I mean, their own family members. Thank you so much. Can we just, before we, we, we move on again, just deal with the issue of ransoms? Probably the area in which we're going to have least candor today, but possibly the most important conversation we can have. Because what's clear in looking at the situation here is that some people pay, and some people don't. And some countries are known to be payers and some countries are known to be a great deal harder to extract money out of. But the fact that some countries do pay is making the problem greater. And Fran, I, I know you have a view, Rodney. I know you have a view. Do you, and anyone else from the audience who wants to, to play into this too, I welcome a contribution. Fran. Well, um, the, the BBC in Alan's case wasn't actually put in this position, but Rodney made the point that um, in advance, you know, we had actually considered the question of whether we should take out the indemnification or not and decided no on the basis that the BBC wasn't going to pay any ransoms if any of our staff did get kidnapped. Once we were into it, obviously the question comes up again, but nobody ever asked us for any money uh, in order to secure Alan's release. They did actually ask us for money to feed him at one point during the course of this operation. Um, Caviar? <laughs> but, uh, but at this what point... What were you asking for? <laughs> At this point, we weren't even sure whether he was alive or not, so the, qu the question never really arose, and it would have been very, very difficult for us, I think, to go down that route for the reasons that you outlined, which are about what is the signal that this would send to everyone else who is thinking of taking hostages around the world, that if you kidnap a correspondent, if you kidnap a BBC correspondent, then you will get money, so you may as well take more of them. And, and that's the signal that would have been sent. Rodney, yeah. Could I just address that point? I, I, I think this is the most difficult issue, uh, after all. One of the Afghans that was released in exchange for the Italian journalist later popped up in an excellent BBC series when he interviewed the Taliban in southern uh, Afghanistan. And he said, because of this, we will now go out, and he said it on, on broadcast, and kidnap journalists because it's a source of income for them. However, that said, we've been talking to international experts on this. The majority of companies around the world uh, who have people kidnap pay ransom. The majority of governments pay ransom, although they often say they don't. You're talking don't. standard companies here, business. I'm sorry, business, 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 yeah. business yeah. concerns, whatever. Yeah. And uh, it is more common for ransom to be paid than not. And if we look at a situation in which a major company has somebody taken hostage, and we say, right, we don't pay ransom, we have A, the difficulty of that person's family saying, well, what do you mean? Well, we're against it in principle, but this is a specific case. He's my brother, he's my father, he's my son, or whatever. 
Why don't you pay? ICI pays ransom, IBM pays ransom, whatever. What's wrong? What's your problem? These are, there's no, I don't have an answer to this, and I don't know anybody who does, but I think it, we should consider that it is not necessarily wrong to pay ransom. Poo. Anyone want to leap into that issue? You do. Can we grab a microphone quickly? Al Jazeera? Uh, yeah, I'm MD of Al Jazeera English. Um, yeah, I'd like to make a couple of points of this and pose a question. Um, firstly, I would agree wholeheartedly um, with um, Rodney. His brain's going again. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure if I, if I was kidnapped and they were asking for, I don't know, 100,000, 500,000, and that was the difference between life and death, uh, I'd prefer to be paid. Um, and I don't think there are any black and white rules here, but I think um, you know, each kidnap situation is different. Um, <clears throat> you know, John McCarthy um, spent five years, we were talking about thresholds being passed earlier, that was a threshold, um, while other hostages were being released because they were paid for. And you know, <clears throat> obviously, Thatcher was in power at the time, and we were under, as a company, huge pressure not to pay anything. Um, I, I, I would have happily seen money paid for him to come out a lot earlier. I think five years was an extremely long time to spend, you know, chained chain to a radiator. Um, so on the on the issue of ransom, I mean, I think you know there, there is no hard and fast rule, and I think it, we should consider paying it um, on a case by case basis. I might take issue with you also on your opening remarks when you said, you know, Terry Waite, Keenan. Uh, McCarthy kidnapped, then, then the problem went away until Daniel Pearl. The problem never went away. It died down. Um, it didn't die down, not around the rest of the world. It died down amongst Western journalists, and ah. I feel we've been very Western-centric. Well, this is um, exactly what we're exploring with. And the question I want to pose is, mm. what do you do when one of your staff is kidnapped by a government? Uh, we have yes. um, a, a cameraman six years in Guantanamo Bay now, uh, without charge, and being severely maltreated by all accounts. Mm. What do we do? Anyone want to address that? Perhaps, perhaps uh, the question I wanted to pose to all of you, actually, we'll, we'll come back to precisely this issue because this, this, this um, encompasses it, is when the Italians started really feeling the heat, the criticism for the deal they'd done over Mastro Giacomo, the foreign minister came out and said, perhaps it's time now to start looking at international protocols, um, an industry-wide uh, code of conduct for dealing with kidnaps, which presumably would also encompass a sort of a pricing structure um, or a, a negotiating framework or nominated people to deal with. He suggested that it was possibly even usefully done under the auspices of NATO, which might then make it a little more universal on someone like an Al Jazeera journalist who's banged up in Guantanamo. Um, how many of you here actually feel that this is all now too disparate that too many people are making isolated decisions about how to handle this, and they would actually appreciate some kind of centralized information service on kidnapping, an industry code of conduct to try and standardize the deals that people are doing, to stop people being divided up and, and, and picked off, basically. Uh, can I have a show of hands? Do you feel it's time for that? Oh. Okay, if not, why not? I think we have a problem in that, as everybody has been saying, each case is so different that it's very difficult to conceive of a code of conduct or a code of behavior that could apply in every single circumstance. I mean, we have experience of a code of conduct for physical safety, which, which we think is good, but it, it, we found in country after country some clauses are applicable and some aren't, but it, it's a guideline. Now, I find it difficult to conceive of a guideline on kidnapping that could be very useful. What I'd like to see, however, is some sort of resource or accessible resource put together either by ourselves in the industry or by the security companies that advise many uh, organizations. Some kind of a hotline and resource line that people can go to. Now, we often get calls from uh, news organizations that have people kidnapped, and we've been able to help in several cases. If we don't know the answers ourselves, we can usually find the people who do. But we don't have the resources to run a 24-hour hotline all over the world. Now, this is something that could be You've usefully set up. protocol that people won't 
vote to sell. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go. But it, it, we need that resource. I think a 24-hour hotline that has regional expertise, that can draw on regional resources, knowledgeable people in the areas, and is available and is there free of charge, because so many people that are taken, they don't all belong to rich media organizations. That would be a good thing to do, but it also would not absolve news organizations themselves for taking responsibility, for pro assuming the planning, getting the structures into place, having their own structures. Heavens, we send out people to cover war zones with tin helmets and flag jackets and everything else. We should have proper preparation also for the physical and trauma implications of kidnapping. I wonder if there's some assumptions made here that that central source of information ultimately is going to be your government or your government's secret service. And that feeds us into the next clip I want to show us. And then a discussion perhaps of, 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 of the higher powers that you might think might be useful to draw in in a crisis or not. If we can just play uh, the clip of uh, the, uh, the Mighty Heart, the film made about uh, the attempts to find out what had happened to Daniel Pearl, a journalist, of course, who's become emblematic of the problem we're now facing. This scene outside the house is out of control. We have to respond. I, uh, I think you should handle most of it, sir. Great. We've gotten hundreds and hundreds of requests. You have an authority that nobody else has to say who Danny is. And they've already said that he's Mossad. They've already said that he's CIA. By not responding, we're, we're tacitly allowing these things to go unchallenged. We all are talking to Colin Powell. Colin Powell has been talking to uh, President Musharraf. Asking him uh, to do what? We also what? Have, uh, got a, uh, I'm sorry. We've also issued a statement uh, saying that Danny did not work for the government, that Danny did not work for the CIA. The CIA has then agreed to issue a statement confirming that. They're going to confirm that publicly? Yeah. The CIA? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're doing everything we possibly can do to make sure that Danny is safe. Who are you going to call? When we had our crisis in Gaza, um, the small Fox nucleus of people who went in there to try and do something about it had a particular view about government involvement. We didn't want any government involvement. We wanted the White House to stay well away. Um, we didn't want any help from Mossad or any of the other people who probably knew exactly what was going on. And we wanted to keep it as tight and as local and as Palestinian as possible. Mind you, if it had gone on for longer than two weeks, we might have changed that view. Now, how helpful is your government likely to be? Do you run the risk of losing your control of your media organization's kidnap and it becoming part of some political agenda, snowballing out of control for you, possibly even endangering the journalist even more. Now, as I say, we didn't get to the point of, um, of needing to appeal further, but there were lots of offers of help and we didn't like the cut of their offer. Um, a lot of experts pile in when a kidnapping happens and only some of them actually are any use to you. That was my experience. You're nodding, Fran. Was that yours too? Um, yes, very much so. But, I mean, if I just talk about the experience that we had, um, pretty closely with the FCO, in fact, on Alan's case, we met with them daily. But, of course, they couldn't go into Gaza or weren't prepared to go into Gaza, and the British didn't have any relationship with uh, Hamas at all. So, actually, we ended up taking the lead on that, but they did pull the levers that we felt were, that, that were appropriate where they could. For instance, the Consul General in Jerusalem pulled quite a lot of um, political levers with Hania. He made a humanitarian visit to Gaza on Alan's behalf. I mean, I think the key here is, you know, what, think about what they can do for you and then use it. But don't assume that actually at some point your agendas are going to be exactly the same. Coming back to your question, Al Jazeera, governments have been no help to you at all, then? Um, yep, it should be working now. Microphone number there two. Are, um, 
No, without doubt there are negotiations underway, finally, um, and I, I, we believe that they're a fairly delicate stage, but you know, in the earlier one that I had some involvement in, in, in John McCarthy, um, the government you know, made itself heavily involved, um, the British government, um, and, and uh, their position was very much no negotiation, hands off. I mean, there were, there were some contacts, but as I say, in that case, I think, um, I think um, the kidnap went on much longer than necessary. I think it could have been solved earlier. Um, the only good thing maybe that came out of those days, I mean, you know, John was kind of thrown into Beirut. He'd never had a foreign assignment before, and that was the way, um, it was a reasonably big organization, WTN, uh, people would behave in those days. I think we have actually come a long way since then. I know Rodney says, you know, we've got a long way. Yes, we do. Um, but most organizations have come a long way since then. We do prepare people for kidnap situations. We do prepare people for combat situations. C can I go to Istanbul here? S Scott Peterson, how helpful did you find the various intelligence agencies that volunteered to intervene in Jill Carroll's case? Well, they did more than volunteer. I mean, they really imposed themselves. Um, as, I mean, when in the case of having an American kidnapped, I mean, the government has in, in Baghdad has a special hostage team. Um, they actually do keep databases on previous uh, and on all hostage situations, in fact. That's what they're meant to draw upon. But really, what we found is that uh, how helpful they are is a function of, of uh, what the, who the individual is who's there and what, um, you know, and, and what they see their role as being. I mean, that organization was, that, that hostage uh, working group was not very helpful in our case. The FBI agents who were very, very nice uh, were very limited. The ones in Baghdad were very limited in what they could do because they themselves couldn't even go to the site where this took place. So they were forced to, to ask the political leader who, we, who was our primary suspect, in fact, if they could do interviews with some of his security guards and security staff, those people would have to be brought into the green zone and they would do their, inter they, they would do their interviews in the green zone. And beyond that, the last thing that we wanted, and we made this very clear to the White House and to the, to the US government, was we didn't want any statement or anything like that that might indicate a special interest in Jill Carroll's case from the US government because what we found out later and of course is a pattern in many of these um, kidnappings is that the, the suspicions of the kidnappers is that she was a spy and were convinced that she was a spy. Now she had to show them day after day, week after week, sometimes literally taking headscarf and they would have to run their fingers through her hair to make sure she had no homing devices. Um, they were asked all kinds of questions constantly about did she have anything embedded in her skin? Did she have anything in her computer that might indicate where they were? Because they felt that sometimes if there was an American raid nearby that, that it was a result of some signal that she somehow had sent out. So in order to minimize those levels of suspicion, um, or, I mean, we, which we were assuming were going to exist on the part of the kidnappers, we really asked for a low-profile uh, government, um, government aspect, but where we really ran into much greater trouble, and this is where, and I'm sure that, uh, that the BBC to a degree ran into this as well um, in dealing with Alan's case, and I think any, anyone does, but uh, we, had the, we had the family of Jill Carroll in Washington and in Boston receiving advice from FBI officials there, and the problem was that the advice they were giving was based on kind of like Bronx uh, hostage, uh, hostage uh, situation guidebook or something that basically yielded a, their, their, their first statement that they were wanting the family to say and that we finally vetoed was a very hostile, very, it was kind of the hostile father approach in which it was a finger wagging thing. In fact, it was, a, it was an example, what they literally said in that, what they wanted uh, the family, the father to say in the statement was literally lay down a gauntlet to the kidnapper saying, you aren't strong enough. You don't have enough willpower to kill my daughter. It was very rough stuff. And of course, not the dynamic that, that applied to Iraq at all. And so a lot of our battles really were fought with um, you know, US kidnap officials, people who are supposed to be experts on this, who just couldn't apply their own um, examples to the Iraq case. Fran, uh, uh, what I learned in the latter stages of Alan's kidnapping was that you knew exactly where he was held. Everyone, you know, the people involved. The area. You, you even knew, well maybe oh. not you, but they knew the restaurants his food was coming from. You had the best intelligence money could buy and you couldn't do anything. 
Well, no, that's because not true, actually, because I think Alan was eating chips from the made in the kitchen of the... <laughs> so, no, and, and in fact, I, I say, you know we, know, we know the area he was in, we had an idea, but we didn't know very much, actually. But the point I'm making is you, you couldn't have acted on that information if you'd had it, because it would have been too dangerous. Indeed, yes. I mean, our assumption was that Alan had been kidnapped by the Dogmush clan and he was being held in somewhere in, where the, in the Dogmush clan area, which is uh, a pretty well-fortified uh, area of uh, Gaza, which actually has roadblocks which are manned by them, and you would be crazy to try to actually infiltrate it in any way. That, that was our assumption. Um, I mean, just picking up on, on some of the things that um, um, Scott was saying, that wasn't quite our experience, I would say, from, from dealing with the, certainly with the government. Um, I'm not saying that everything was all sweetness and light with them, but actually, on the whole, they did seem sort of pretty flexible about how they wanted to approach this. Um, and there wasn't any of the sort of... Um, uh, lack of sensitivity because, of course, there were these demands that came in at, at, uh, after about three weeks to the government uh, and then there was an issue about how we would respond and this was a collective thing that we did with them uh, it, and we were prepared, they were prepared to take our views into account as we were theirs. One of the really interesting things we can't spend, we've, we've got about 15 minutes still to go, and I, I do want to give you a chance to ask Alan or Fran or, or, or Rodney or indeed Anthony anything if you want to. A couple of areas I want to tackle. One of the interesting things for me that I learned this morning talking to your colleague Paul was that in the end a lot of the negotiating process ended up being conducted on the internet. You ended up opening a channel of communication with the kidnappers themselves through the medium of jihadi websites. Now that seemed to me to be a, a remarkably modern and, and new a new departure in terms of dealing with a kidnap. Does anyone want to speak? Do you want Paul, do you want to I mean this goes outside this goes outside previous frameworks. Can I just first pick up on a on a small point, but an important point about dealing with the government in this. And that is that of course the government is acting on behalf of the citizen, the citizen who's been kidnapped and the citizen's family. And the employer, which you are, is only one is, is only one party in the whole dynamic. So to some extent you do have to work with them, and I entirely accept Scott's uh, account of you know, the level of advice and help that he was getting. In fact, found once we did establish those relationships, and we, we, we received a lot of good support, and it was extremely helpful. And it leads on to how, in the beginning, uh, I mean, for a month there was no communication at all from the, from the kidnappers, and after a month they issued demands, but they did it through an intermediary to the Foreign Office. Their demands were of the British government, not of the BBC. Um, and for a while, the Foreign Office were in the lead. Uh, but there came a point, as you pointed out, when that wasn't going anywhere from the kidnappers' point of view, and they, they drove us towards uh, a direct negotiation through the internet. Um, and we ended up communicating with the kidnappers on a daily basis um, through a a chat room on a jihadi website, essentially. Extraordinary. But always, I stress, you know, in conjunction with the Foreign Office and their experts and constructing the replies together and making sure we had a, a joined-up strategy about it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I know the BBC did tremendously well, Alan, was look after your family while yeah, you were in there. That's for sure. One of the things that, I, that certainly just filled my mind in those few, first few days, there was a series of regrets. Well, one of them was that I had stayed in Gaza so long, and uh, uh, one of them was, was certainly what I'd done to my parents. You know, I, my, both of them are in their 70s. I was worried that Dad would have a heart attack or whatever, and I just worried and worried and worried about them. And uh, if I guess the BBC would, 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 would help them, but I had no idea just how much the B would stand, stand by them, you know. Uh, and when I came out, uh, I, I really couldn't have been more grateful or impressed by, by what had been done. There, there was almost always somebody in the village in Scotland where they lived, of very senior people were, were visiting them regularly. They were kept informed in the loop. And, uh, you know, if I had known that there was that kind of... Um, service they were going to get before I went in, it would have eased my mind a great deal. Anthony Feinstein, uh, this is all a crucial part, I would imagine, of, of sustaining the mental health of your, not only your, your, 
person who's been kidnapped, but of course their wider family, their wider community. In fact, this traumatizes an entire organization to a degree. Yes, but I think it's also important to put the, you know, my results in context, because what we found from seven years studying journalists is that they're a very resilient bunch. So even if they've gone through something that is potentially very traumatic, it doesn't mean that you necessarily come out the other side with psychopathology or traumatized. In fact, the majority do not. There's a resilience to this profession. I think the trick is to be able to identify which individuals have been traumatized and then to provide the necessary support to those individuals. Because if you don't do that, trauma has a tendency to fester. It doesn't, psychological trauma, it doesn't clear up spontaneously. Or if it does, it takes a long time. And when it festers, the individual suffers, relationships suffer, spouses have difficulty, children pay a price as well. And I've seen that at first hand. It sounds like the situation here has been managed very well in terms of the, the staying in contact with family and keeping them informed. But it's not always like that. You told me that you are getting crisis calls now from foreign journalists seeking help because they're not getting support from the news organizations they work for. Well, I think one of the big challenges that I face in my work is dealing with freelancers because they often find out about the work that I've done and then contact me via the internet saying, please help. And so I'm starting to get messages from Somalia and Pakistan from journalists saying, you know, we've got some real problems over here, what should we do? And there aren't the resources or the expertise to provide the necessary help for some of these individuals, for most of these individuals. I can quickly go back to Afghanistan, to Kabul. What, one of the more heartbreaking uh, things I read in, in the wake of, of, uh, of what happened around the release of uh, Mastro Giacomo was the families of the two Afghans working with him who said, no one's rung us, no one's liaised with us, not, uh, not the Afghan government, not the Italian government, not the news organizations. We know nothing. No, no one's helped us find the bodies. No one. Is this typical? Yes, in the case of in the case of the two, uh, uh, in the case of these two Afghan journalists, uh, so far nothing in my notice, nothing have been done. Nothing at all. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Nothing at all. The families yeah, were okay, very nothing distressed. Nothing have been done in that. Nothing at all. No. Nothing. No. Nothing in the. In, in, I don't know. Nothing have been done from the Italian government or from the Afghan government, even for, uh, as. Uh, the father had a lot of difficulties bringing his uh, the dead body of his son back from Helmand. And then through the help of some tribal elders uh, from that community of, in Helmand province, they brought the body first down to Kandahar, and then from Kandahar they sent it down to Kabul. So uh, they haven't got any kind of help from the Afghan government, whether from or from the international community. Uh, in terms of uh, Saidaga, because his, he and his family were living in Lashkargah, so in bringing...